and talk about using uh, model-based systems engineering and actually doing an application in the, in the hospital setting. And we're doing this right now uh, with a technology that we use called extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, which is essentially an artificial heart-lung machine, and we'll, we'll talk a bit more about that. Um, so I'm, I'm the, the clinical piece of this, uh, and uh, Drew Pajera, who's one of my uh, engineering colleagues over at Georgia Tech Research, uh, Research Institute, uh, has been uh, crucial in, in making all this happen. I'm presenting, again, both of our work here today. Uh, but I think I need to start this talk with some disclosures. The first being, I'm a doctor. Uh, I am not an engineer. I have absolutely no engineering background. And, um, you know, when you go and, and talk to physicians that work at my hospital, not, the number of them who are going to know or understand the concept of, of system engineering is a tiny percentage of people. Now, they have some of the skills to be able to do and accomplish these, these things that you all are talking about and doing. They just know them by different names. And so very much uh, uh, like they were talking about, coming up with a common language that we can talk about and talk together in is, is going to be crucial. Um, I, I'm standing here in front of you and, and, and got involved in this project back in 2011. Um, because of, of this young lady that you see here. Uh, this is Lindsay uh, on one of her uh, probably worst days in, in her life. Lindsay's a little 14-year-old girl um, who was perfectly fine, perfectly healthy, um, and in about a period of 48 hours, she went from uh, riding around on her bike after school to being in my ICU and essentially dying. Uh, she had absolutely horrible pneumonia uh, on both sides that she got from uh, influenza uh, that she caught, the common flu. Um, and Lindsay uh, was tempted to be supported by all of the complex medical care we can provide. The fanciest ventilators, the, um, you know, the best uh, set of doctors that you could come up with. Um, and wonderful first-rate uh, health care. However, none of that was working, and uh, she was at a point where literally she was going to die. And the only cho chance that she really had was to put her on this ECMO machine, which again is an artificial heart-lung machine. And we did that, and this is her, and you can see this is a, a huge tube here draining blood out of her to go to this big artificial lung. I spent a long time talking with uh, her, her parents. And I came in, we got her stabilized. Came in the next morning and went into the room, you know, expecting to have a normal conversation with mom and dad, as normal as it can be when you're talking to somebody whose kid is really sick. And I walk in the room and her father looks at me and he says, my daughter's gonna die. And at that point, I thought, well, this is doing what I do. This is a conversation I've had many times. And so pull up a chair and sit down and start to go through his feelings. And started to try and tell him, no, we're doing these things. We need to give her time. I've seen lots of kids come through all of this. And he turns to me and he says, no, you, you, you don't understand. He said, I think you're going to kill my daughter. And I kind of paused. And I said, tell me, tell me what you mean. And he said, I've been looking at this machine that she's hooked up to. And it looks like you've pieced this thing together. And... I've sat and talked to the people who are sitting at her bedside, and they seem to have a good handle on things, but everybody seems to be waiting for a complication and a mistake to happen. And my next question was, 
what do you do? <laughs> you know, you're, 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 you're right, and acknowledge some of these things to him. I said, what do you do? And he's an aviation engineer for Lockheed Martin. And so I've got somebody who's sitting there who clearly understands, you know, he works in a world where you can't even think about making a change without talking with the FAA, you know, and, and where, you know, systems engineering is, is really built out. And, you know, I had to sit there and be real honest with him and say, you know, you're right. And part of what I'm going to do is try and make that change and try and figure out how I can make this uh, situation safer and so that we can use it. Because so many times what we do in medicine is what's represented here. We get some new piece of equipment, we hook it up to a patient and say, come on, let's go. Let's go try and fix these people. And so that's how, uh, you know, that's how a clinician is sitting here talking to, to a group of engineers. We'll talk a little bit more about Lindsay as we go. So what I do for a, for a living is I'm a, a pediatric ICU doctor. I'm the kind of pediatrician you never want to meet, okay? Because if you do, it means your kid is really sick. Um, and so I want to start by teaching you a little bit about these kind of patients that I, that I take care of. And so we'll start with this. This is a normal x-ray uh, of, of a patient. And so um, when you look at an x-ray, did the pointer go away or is that what this is? Well, anyway, when you... That was you, working. Is it working? Uh, let's see if I can figure it out. No, I'm not an anesthesiologist. He's fancier than I am. Did it work? Oh, that's the mic. Yeah. There we go. There it is. Here it is. You got it? Yeah, there we go. Just seeing the wrong thing. Um, so this is a normal x-ray of a person. So when you're looking at x-rays, uh, bones show up white, tissue shows up white, air shows up white. Okay? And so this is a, a, a normal, healthy 17-year-old. And so you've got your spine that comes down the middle here. You can see all the ribs coming out on the sides here, collarbones leading down to the arms. Nice big blob in the middle is the heart, and I just point out how crisp the definition of the heart is here. You can see all the edges. You got your diaphragms here, which separate the, uh, the chest and the abdominal cavity, and again, you can see clear delineation between them, and then all this black stuff on the side, uh, on both sides of the heart, which are the lungs, and they're black because they're filled with air, as, as they should be. Um, and so that's, uh, that's what a normal x-ray looks like. This is Lindsay's x-ray, um, right before she uh, went on ECMO. And so you can see all of these structures and all of these things that are very clearly visible here, you can't see anything. And uh, this is with Lindsay on uh, what's called a high-frequency ventilating oscillator. It's the, uh, the, the most powerful ventilator in the world that we have to be able to drive air into the lungs. And again, air should show up black. You've got essentially no black at all in here, and she is uh, she is dying. Um, and so, when uh, when you run into this situation, what we typically offer to patients is something called ECMO, which stands for extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. I'm going to take your blood. I'm going to take it outside the body. I'm going to run it through an artificial lung, which is going to do the job of the lung. It's going to put oxygen in the blood, take carbon dioxide, the waste gas out, and then I'm going to return it to the body. And depending on how we, uh, we do this setup, we can provide just lung function for patients, or we can actually replace their heart function as well. So literally after I get done putting a patient on a device like this, their heart doesn't have to be beating and they don't have to be breathing. I can do all of that work for them. Um, and so this is a, you know, a very general schematic of, you know, we're going to drain the blood out, run it through some sort of pump, which is going to keep the blood pushing forward through this extracorporeal circuit, through that membrane oxygenator, and then, uh, and then back to the patient. Um, and so uh, ECMO is something that really has not been around all that long. It was first developed and first successfully used by Dr. Bartlett in, in 1975. Um, 
and uh, the story of its first use is uh, is a little bit interesting in that um, we had a uh, there was a little girl who had uh, the mother had come across the the border in Southern California to deliver her baby. The baby was born, was uh, uh, incredibly ill with an x-ray that looked very similar, um, and uh, the child was, was dying. The mother uh, gave permission to Dr. Bartlett to, uh, to use uh, this, uh, at that point, experimental device on her. Um, and uh, then the mother left and, uh, and went back uh, into Mexico, never to be seen again. The ICU nurses uh, took care of her and uh, named her Esperanza, the Spanish word for hope. And, uh, and they were able to use this device and use it successfully on her. And Esperanza is now what, 41 years or 39 years old um, and has, uh, has three children of her own. Uh, but what this uh, device does is, again, it provides the function of the heart and lungs. Um, it is used only in cases where all traditional management has failed. And so we're talking about people who are incredibly ill. You're talking about roughly 20% chance of survival in these patients. And what we see and what we've learned is by using this device, we can improve survival up to about 75%. Um, and we actually keep, uh, keep records. We have an international registry of all of the patients who have ever been placed on, uh, on this device. And we're up over that time period to about 65,000 uh, patients that have received this therapy. Again, still a tiny number when we look at the total number of people treated. But again, you can see survival rates are, you know, range anywhere from 40s to 74% with the overall being 60%. But even if it's 60%, you're talking about taking somebody who's got a 20% chance of survival and, and, and tripling that. Um, as you can see, and we'll talk about later, most of the patients that have been taken care of are, are neonates, but we've got increasing numbers of, of both pediatric and, and adult patients. Um, so, I mean, this really sounds simple enough. We're just going to take the blood out of the body, run it through this machine, and then, and then put it back into it. But, but ECMO really isn't this simple. And when you really talk about systems systems, th th this is something that, uh, you know, d definitely applies. So this is a picture that one of, uh, my, patient, one of my patient's fathers took with a fisheye lens uh, in, uh, in our ICU. And if we just take a minute to step through this, we've got the patient here in the middle um, surrounded by all of this equipment. These are those cannulas that are draining the blood out of the patient. We've got, it drains it down here to this pump that's sitting uh, down there on the floor uh, because all of this drainage is passive and done by, by gravity. So we have to uh, have a, a nice height differential between the two. Um, and then we've got all the other devices. So hidden behind this device is actually a dialysis machine. This is that uh, high frequency oscillating ventilator. Uh, this is another device that provides uh, medical gas inhaled nitric oxide to the, to the patient uh, to help. I've got, uh, for patients that are this ill, they actually need two caregivers to take care of them. They need a, um, a nurse to take care of the patient, and then we need another caregiver called an ECMO specialist who does nothing but take care of all of this equipment. So one nurse has the patient, one nurse has the equipment uh, to take care of. And then we've got all of these monitoring and control systems for all of these individual pieces that we have here. And so uh, I've got the arrows up there covering it. I've taken the time to count on this screen. And we, we talked a little bit about this earlier when Julian showed his pictures of IV pumps. His nine IV pumps was nothing. So <laughs> there, are th there are 48 LED or LCD displays here at the bedside that are all delivering information to that ECMO specialist who needs to be able to take, interpret all that information, and act on it. And, and by the way, if we have any fault here, the patient, uh, has, the patient will essentially die. They're completely reliant on these machines. Yes, sir? So I'm kind of struck by if you, uh, 
took your high performance sports car and drove into a garage that looked like that, would you leave it for service? No. <laughs> and that's the point, I, I, that, that's part of the point I want to make here. Do, do not get me wrong when I go through this. This is a wonderful life saving technology that we can, that we're using. We're not using it effectively and we're not using it safely. And that's why I'm here and that's what I want to talk about because we, we need to get this back to a point where we, can, uh, where we can improve the safety of this to be able to use it in other, um, you know, in other patients. And it's an incredibly important point. Can I, while, we, while you're answering the question. Absolutely. For, for someone who's old enough to remember, you know, the original heart-lung machine. Yeah. What's the difference between this and a heart-lung machine? Yeah. So, a bit different. So, and I'm going to cover that in about two slides. So oh, okay. We'll, 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 when, when it comes we'll, up. We'll, we'll, we're going to go through that. Okay. Um, and so, you know, that's, um, so, so that's what it looks like, and that's just ECMO. But it's really not even as simple as that, because many of these patients also have other, I've talked about being able to support their heart and their lungs, but many, many of them also have other support. And so then we take and integrate into this system a dialysis machine to provide kidney support for these patients and a, a plasma exchange machine to provide liver support to these patients. Again, all of these systems never designed to work together, but yet they're now allowing me at the bedside to provide heart, liver, kidney, and uh, heart, liver, kidney, and lung support uh, to a patient and uh, that, that we can get by without. So, the problem comes with this in, in very much relates to what John's question is, is how is this different from a heart-lung machine? And it's different in a few ways. So you cannot go out, an ECMO, ECMO is a therapy. ECMO is a way of providing these supports. It is not a product. You cannot pick up the phone and call Medtronic or any other large company and say, I would like to buy an ECMO machine because they don't exist. And so um, what all of these are are pieces of equipment that are all FDA approved for some other use. So the pumps, for example, are the same pumps that we use in a cardiopulmonary bypass setting. Uh, some of the heat exchangers have other uh, uses, the IV pumps and stuff, um, you know, obviously we use in other scenarios. But, um, and, and people uh, take and assemble all of those things into, into an ECMO system. But there is no standardization, and so it varies. ECMO at Emory looks very different than ECMO at Michigan, which looks very different from ECMO in Washington, D.C., which looks very different from ECMO in California. And so, uh, because, uh, because there is no standardization. Um, the other difference between this and cardiopulmonary bypass is cardiopulmonary bypass, you're talking about um, four hours, six hours in the operating room. All of those devices are engineered in that setting to be used intermittently for four or six hours at a time, multiple times a day, and all of the analyses and stuff that we've done around them are in that scenario. Patients on ECMO are receiving this therapy on average for two weeks and many patients up to a month or two. And so, you know, we've got very different, uh, you know, uh, while some of it may be the same equipment, it is certainly being used out of the, uh, out of what it was originally engineered for. Was this originally, I mean, are there specialists in children's hospitals all across the country that do the same thing but differently? Absolutely. Okay. So the children's hospital in Pittsburgh do it differently than Absolutely. Yeah. And all have different equipment. Yes, ma'am. So actually, how many independent medical devices are in that environment? That, that, is a, that is a wonderful question. And so it's going to depend on the patient. A minimum of 20. Okay. Uh, a minimum okay. of 20. Sometimes. So mostly infusion pumps or mostly other? Okay. All sorts of things. Okay. Oxygenation pump, or oxygenators, <coughs> pumps. Uh, different pieces, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's quite a bit, uh, and it's a, a, a very complicated system. And because it's a complicated system, you need a really highly trained group of staff to be able to run this. And again, I've kind of touched on before, <coughs> patients are completely reliant on this device to be able to live. 
And so you really need second-to-second -second monitoring ability and people there at the bedside who can react to faults or error situations and be able to, uh, to, to act on them quickly. And so one more point and then, I'll, and then I'll take your question. So it's not surprising that in such a complex system there's a very high complication rate. And we know that patients have, when they have complications, they're more likely to die. So that 60% survival that you would expect if you've got two complications or more drops down to about 40%. Many of the complications are actually related to the fact to our anticoagulation management. You've got all this blood touching a bunch of plastic and a bunch of foreign surfaces. Blood outside the body wants to do one thing and that's clot. And so uh, we have, uh, we monitor the coagulation status of these patients every hour. Um, and so, you know, 24 times a day we're, uh, we're, we're monitoring that. And it's a very delicate balance because I need to use heparin, my anticoagulant, to thin the blood enough so that I don't get clots and so my artificial lung will work, but the blood still has to stay thick enough so that I'm not hemorrhaging out of my recent surgery site that I needed to, to put these cannulas in. Yes, sir. So, so what fraction of the mortality is due to the patient fail versus the system fail? Yeah, that, that is unknown. Since 1975, <coughs> folks haven't looked at, at that. The best number I can give you is attributable mortality to complications is estimated to be about 20%. But that's about the best number I can that's give you. That's system complications. It is. So just wrapping up my question, so yeah. a heart-lung machine is something you can buy as, as a unit? As a package, oh, yes. Okay. Absolutely. So what, what we did was joined with the, the folks at Georgia Tech and, uh, and their professional uh, masters of uh, applied system engineering and, uh, and the folks at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. We started this back in 2011 with a stated long-term goal of taking the, the long-term version of this of improving ECMO. And so a, a, you know, part of that initial work was just going through all the trouble to figure out, you know, like, uh, like Chris said earlier, define your problem, okay? And so coming out with uh, what does that look like? And then we can take that and use that same uh, workflow that he showed to actually model what our problem is and, uh, and look and see uh, how we can get to what our, uh, what our desired state would be in the future. So practically the way this works is um, we've got these professional master's students who are there for 12 weeks during the summer. Um, we spend time uh, working on one aspect of this and then we use the other 40 weeks out of the year to go and try and implement their changes. So uh, we started with just one center at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta in 2011, um, expanded that collaboration to the centers that you see there um, in following years and then um, in 2014, we actually had our group talk to nine different other centers that we had not previously collaborated with across the U.S. Uh, to try and get uh, try and get more data. Uh, because again, if you've got a, sy a system that has no standardization, part of where you first need to start is figuring out where are we to start, and then and then we can work on on that standardization. So what the first cohort did was. Um, spent time characterizing the existing system at Children's and worked on uh, coming up with some future work um, where we were looking to improve safety, uh, reduce complexity, and work toward uh, standardization with the ultimate goal of actually being able to create an ECMO product that then we could take uh, that would be standardized, that we could take to the FDA, Get um, you know get approval for it so that we could reduce this uh, tremendous variability. But before we could do any of that, we ran into the same problem that Julian and others here have talked about this morning: is that problem of communication. Again, I'm a doctor. I don't uh, I, I don't have any engineering background, and so we spent uh, spent a lot of time coming up with uh, how do we actually uh, communicate. And some of the SysML modeling tools and stuff that uh, the systems engineers use were actually very, very helpful with that. Our, our second cohort uh, kind of expanded on this work, started on uh, some trade space analyses. The third group that we did actually um, uh, are helping us 
develop a web prototype so that we can actually characterize what all of these different circuits all across the U.S. look like. And our fourth cohort um, has uh, worked on uh, data gathering and doing interviews from various centers to look at uh, just where are we in terms of do centers actually have protocols for how they do things and, and why they do things. You uh, have a student, but you have a professor that you're also with, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And so the, the, the PMACE course at, at Georgia Tech, it's not just one, there are four different, uh, four different professors that are help leading this multidisciplinary group of the engineers, the physicians, okay. and the, the ECMO team around. Yeah, absolutely. Because we've really got to have that people, it, it's all about assembling the right team to yeah. tackle a problem, and, and we've got to have those folks. Um, and so how models uh, based system engineering can start to help these problems are work on this problem of, of standardization between sites. Let's figure out what we think an improved state uh, of a standardized circuit should look like and then uh, be able to take and look at the existing circuits and pr figure out how to model and come up with what a best of breed circuit would look like that then we could uh, ultimately develop and, and take to FDA. We need to work on, on our staffing and see, you know, right now we have to have these incredibly high, uh, highly trained staff. And are there methods of doing similar things that Julian was talking about, uh, areas where we can use automated, automated data capture to uh, reduce this burden on our staff? And, you know, a big, uh, one of my real pet peeves in the ICU, just to, to focus for a second on what, uh, what Julian was saying is, I need my nurses to be nurses. I don't need them to be transcriptionists. And that's what they're turning into. They look at this device, they see the number, they turn around and they enter it into the, uh, into the EMR. And we need to find some ways that we can, uh, that we can do that. And then the, the last thing that we wanted to try and do was try and figure out a way that we can take all of the data from those 48 LED and LCD displays and fuse that data into some sort of heads-up display that's in, in one location. You know, one, one of the things, and you can see it in our picture, but you can also see it in Julian, but that you might not think about is, all of those IV infusion pumps are the same. They're the same brand, same manufacturer. That means when the alarm goes off, I'm now searching through 30 different pumps to try and figure out which one has the fault. And, and you know how do, how do we do that? And how do you do that rapidly when the medicine that's infusing is one that's actually keeping the heart going? Um, and so to, to look at those. So, um, so we started this out with, uh, with doing some stakeholder interviews, um, which uh, you know, really helped to kind of inform the model of, of, uh, of what our stakeholders were, what ECMO structure was, and, and what behavior is. And, and, you know, this, it, it, it sounds, and this is just kind of the level medicine is at. And I, I put this out there not to put us down, but just to say this is where we are. The concept of saying who are actually my customers and who are my stakeholders for a technology, that is something that's unheard of in medicine, in, in, in the most, in clinical medicine that, that, that I do. And so that in and of itself you know, started a whole lot of conversations to, uh, that, that were helpful. And then we did use some, um, some uh, systems engineering techniques to, to go through and capture the need and be able to show um, what, the, uh, what the improved state uh, looks like. And I'm not going to go through the, um, all of the details of this, but, um, you know, I think the, the important point about this is it shows, uh, you know, who is involved, the time intervals in which we're, we're looking at, and how we're going to uh, communicate visually uh, this kind of data to our, uh, to, to our customers. And then we took the time to, to use the, the power of SysML to, um, to capture our stakeholders and to look and go through uh, what all the relationships between all of these people are. Um, and again, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to kind of rush through a bit of this because we're summarizing four, four years of work in, in 45 minutes. But, um, uh, but you know, in, in able to do this, you know, this, this allows us to, um, to help uh, know who's doing what, what roles they're playing, and when we're seeing these extra burdens, to be able to identify where they are and what is, uh, what is leading up to that. 
and we did this for, for our center. The other thing that we did was um, is uh, used uh, structural diagrams to go ahead and capture this uh, structure both at a systems level and a systems of systems level. Um, and uh, because if our ultimate goal out of this is to promote standardization, we're going to have to understand and know how this system is structured and how it's going to behave at, at, at the various locations. You're, you're trying to share this material with these other new hospitals that are coming on board and then compare them with your, this is your baseline. So, so, so we have done this at our center and we are, those other centers that I mentioned, we're trying, we're working to do the same thing at those, those are existing centers. My ultimate goal is, and I'll show you at the end of this talk, we've got a rapid rise in new centers providing this therapy. So that's, that's where we need this to go, is to show people how to set this up correctly from the get-go and not have to backtrack over 30 years of, in, uh, inter, of uh, institutional inertia uh, you know, to, 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 to have to accomplish that. Um, and, and we were able to, to look and, and go through these things, create some N-squared diagrams showing uh, all of these loops and how this inf information is being deployed and to be able to use this to say uh, not only where are we now but where do we want to be. Um, and the other thing that these loops allow us to do is to find uh, places where that are ripe for uh, minimizing uh, human interaction. Where are the points where we can uh, do automated data entry, those kind of things. Um, and then uh, one, of the, one of the things, practical things that came out of this was uh, we developed a prototype uh, of how we could actually come up with, the way I envision it is the equivalent of a, a fighter pilot's heads up display to be able to take all of these different data fields, put them in one location, and when I have an error or something, then that uh, piece of data comes to center of sight so that uh, we can, uh, so that the uh, uh, ECMO specialist who's there actually can, uh, can deal with that uh, and know where to go. It's pump three, which is, you know, right here or there, and they know this is where the problem is. This is what's happening. Go fix it. <clears throat> and then one of the final tools that we came up with, and again, this goes back to that, that concept of uh, being able to speak the same language. Um, we have all of these different circuits all around the, the country, um, but the people who are running them aren't engineers mostly, they're clinicians. And so I need a way to capture what all of those circuits look like. And so we created a web-based version um, that we call our data collaboration tool, um, which has all of the different components of an ECMO circuit here. And you can have a specialist at any individual uh, uh, place go and actually virtually build what their circuit looks like. So I use this cannula, I use this oxygenator, I use this pump. And then buried in this is uh, and, and these are what pictures of what the actual things looks like. And so they know their oxygenator looks like this. They click on that and drag it to its appropriate spot. When they do, it's going to open up and say, okay, there are actually three models that are like this. Which one are you using? And that way, not only do we get the total topography of what their circuit looks like, but now we start to have uh, to be able to collect actual specific manufacturer uh, data and, and things like that. The other thing that is, is neat, so this is a, a user-friendly thing that um, clinicians and non-engineers can do. Then what we can do is actually take this data, uh, convert it into a node diagram that then we can save into a database so that then we can go back and actually recreate and start to look at differences. So do uh, this part of the component here is called a bridge, which allows blood flow to flow from the arterial side to the venous side. And we can start to ask questions like, what are the complication and thrombosis rates in circuits that have a bridge and don't have a bridge? Or, uh, you know, those very simple questions, which have never been even thought to be asked. This yes, applies the basic rules for compatibility checking and it's very powerful. Ab absolutely, absolutely. And, and all of those are the things that we're, uh, that we're building into this. And what we're doing is we're going to take this and in partnership with ELSO, which is the extracorporeal life support organization, which is the one that keeps that registry of 65,000 patients, 
incorporate this into the ELSO registry so that now I have the outcomes linked with the actual hardware and, and to, to do just exactly those kind of uh, studies. Um, so the, the fourth group that just finished uh, started with uh, these multi-center uh, interviews. They've got many, we've got many problems that I've talked about here and that you all have, have, have realized. And so we have to start about where should we start with all this. So we've got centers, nine centers here with a vast range of experience. They all use different equipment. These, uh, the engineers came up with, well, they came up with over 100 questions that they wanted to ask. Uh, I narrowed it down to 32 because I realized I was going to have to be the one getting on the phone calling these people saying, I need you to spend a time, an hour with one of my engineers and they've got these questions they want to ask you and please do this and next time I see you dinner's on me um, to, to get folks to actually sit down and do this. And then I was actually shocked when the engineers came back and we sat down to go through this data. They said that the median interview time that people were spending when they started hearing these questions was four hours. And they spent 12 hours with one center over a period of days going through all this because these are exactly the questions that people want. And so I, I show that to say there's a desire here to change. And people, when, they're, when some of these questions are brought up, they realize there's an issue. How many ECMO centers in the country are there? There are about 200, 200, 220 in the U.S. There are about 400 nationwide or worldwide. Um, and so we came up with a prioritization matrix. I don't expect you to be able to read all that, so we'll just skip to the, the next slide, which comes up with the highlights. So the two big things, areas that came out of the prioritization matrix are standardization, reliability, failure analyses, and then this training and manpower. So I think it's important to realize, of these nine centers, none of them, when we talk about standardization, none of them had the same circuit configuration, okay? Um, and when we talk about failure analyses, they simply have never been done in the ECMO setting. Again, like we talked about uh, with John's question about uh, cardiopulmonary bypass. All of these things are engineered for six hours. When they go through FDA and are rated, they're rated for six hours. And so nobody has ever said, what happens if we run one of these pumps and what's the mean time between failure if we run them 24 hours a day for you know, a period of time? Those things have never been done. Um, and and you know, how many hours is reasonable? I looked right before I left. My, my youngest pump has 11,000 hours on it. My oldest one has just over 40,000. Um, you're supposed to replace a cardiopulmonary bypass pump at about five to 7,000 hours, right? And so, you know, but we just don't know. And so we're stuck in a situation of being reactive rather than, uh, than proactive. The other thing that you run into in these centers is that some centers, they don't even have standardization within their own center. They have multiple different kinds of pumps that they're using, which then you have to keep people trained on. And I don't need to tell you guys why that's a bad idea. Um, and, and then one of the things that was very scary to me was Half of the centers have no formal review process for cha making changes in their ECMO circuits. And so it's not surprising that we get a situation where we got mixtures of pumps like this because Dr. X talked to Dr. Y over here who had good luck with this and now we have 20 of these new pumps that were ordered and are sitting here, right? And, and, and the same thing happens. And so, you know, getting the engineers involved in this, coming up with a formal uh, thing, again, this just sh shows you how low the bar is for some of these things in medicine and where, where we can really help. And then uh, a bunch of training and manpower issues that, uh, that, that we went through. Um, the folks here did a whole lot of additional work, uh, did uh, some human interfaces analysis, work domain analysis, risk analysis of, of these recommendations that they came up with. And you can see them here, and they're, they're things that are not groundbreaking. You look at these and, you know, in a lot of ways these are duh. You know, we ought to be training people regularly. We ought to be giving them uh, documentation on, uh, on these things. We ought to be uh, eliminating and making our circuits as simple as we can and do all this. But just these very simple recommendations have been important because this is something we've been able to take to ELSO, an international group, and be able to promulgate these as, uh, you know, as, as guidelines and, and recommendations. 
And so just to finish this, you know, I kind of get to the, the so what argument. You, you can get a bunch of students, you can make a bunch of pretty pictures and graphs and, and all this stuff, but how do I bring this back to the patient? How do I bring this back to actually um, improving the safety and improving the care of the people who I'm taking care of? Um, and we've actually done a lot in that. We've, we've developed this common language that we can use internationally we now have a tool that we can use to assess what the current state of our situation is, and we've got uh, some models of what our, what our ideal state would be. We've got to get ourselves to that point of, of standardization that can allow the reduction of, of complications. We've actually made changes to an international registry that follows this to actually gather this data, and so it's coming in. You know, every new pay I put a new patient on yesterday before I left to fly up here. And you know that patient's data goes in there, and so in a very short you know period of a, a year, 18 months, we're going to actually have some meaningful numbers that we're going to be able to look into. Um, and, and this project has really served as an impetus uh, to have this start this conversation in the ECMO community. And I alluded to this earlier, but why is now the right time to be doing this? Um, so this is from the ELSO registry. And this looks at adult ECMO runs. And you see from 1990 up until 2008, you stayed at somewhere between 50 and 100 cases a year. And then you see this big spike in 2009. What happened in 2009? Anybody remember? Not Portable Care Act? Not Portable Care Act. H1N1 influenza. Okay. And so what happened, at ECMO was not used, as this graph shows you, in any meaningful way in the adult world. And what happened during H1N1 was adult doctors saw normal, healthy 30, 40-year-olds come down with horrible illness. They thought they were going to die, and many of them did. And what happened was in certain places where there were ECMO centers, the PEDS guys said, Give me that adult patient. I know they're 30. I don't care. Bring them over here. And then these adult docs said, man, that patient survived. And so that was the first kind of light bulb of this might actually be right. When doctors start seeing people they expect to die that actually go on to live, that changes. Then it, in 2010, there was a randomized trial that was published that showed ECMO was effective and showed in, in adult respiratory failure. And we've really been off to the races since then. Um, and so, you know, again, you're, you've got 1,500 adult cases that are being done. So They're taking the, the pediatric ICU. Now adult centers are, are starting it. I want out of the adult business. Adults are big and smelly and they don't listen to you. Okay? And so uh, I don't want to take care of adults. Now I do and I will when I have to. But I would much rather have a nice adult partner who can, uh, who, who can care for those folks. Um, and so we've got a bunch of future projects that are, that are going to go on. I think just you know, to, to summarize this, um, I think using the systems engineering approach has really improved and bridged that doctor-engineer language barrier. We feel that it's, uh, we've shown this in a healthcare domain, but we think that it can be uh, beneficial in other non-engineering domains. And, um, and it, what it comes down to is this truly is, this effort is truly improving the care of my individual patients. Um, and so, you know, I'll, I'll end you with this, which is Lindsay in obviously one of her much better days. Um, after she's gone back after two weeks of ECMO to, um, to being a nice, uh, uh, normal kid who just started college last year. Um, but, you know, I think, uh, again, how do I find myself here talking to a group of systems engineers? I think back to that conversation I had with her father, um, and that's what the goal of this project is. The goal of this project is to make this safer, and so that uh, we stop having complications and so that we can uh, provide this care to uh, a whole lot more people. Thank you very much. Is there time for a few questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, so you model the system that's got machines in it, it's got people in it, 
What, what parts did you find that MBSE worked well on and what parts were difficult? Terrific. Yeah. Um, so let me start with saying in many ways, so I, I, in many ways, this is like the worst system in the world to choose is the thing you're going to start with, right? Be nice to start with some infusion pumps, some, something simple. We kind of went for, for all of it. Um, part of uh, the, the part, to, to go back and answer your, your, your question, I think, I think the part that was the people were the most difficult part to, to work with and to model. And part of it is most of the time when patients are needing this therapy, or pretty much all the time, it is an emergency. And so normal workflows don't apply um, and, or aren't followed, one of the two. Um, and so that makes the modeling of the personnel in the, you know, as you go through the life cycle of somebody going, of somebody who needs ECMO, goes on ECMO, is maintained on ECMO, comes off ECMO, and goes through that. The modeling of that first piece of the initiation of ECMO with the people was and remains very difficult to, uh, to model. Um, and, and so I, I think that has been much more of a struggle than the equipment. Um, yes, sir? You, you described what appears to be um, the assembly of a collection of commercial off-the-shelf products from a, a variety of different vendors. Right. You didn't mention the issue associated with mapping terminology differences between these respective vendors. How have you addressed that problem and, and what progress have you made? Yeah, um, not as much as I would like, <laughs> to, to, to be real honest with you. Um, it, it, it does, uh, this is where we get into some of the, the black box problem of when we start, and Julian touched on this a bit earlier, I may, I, I may have three different devices that are all measuring pressures for me, yet they're all doing it in a different way and with different sampling rates and, and, and such. And getting that information from the vendors has actually been very difficult and has stymied some of our progress in there. And so, um, you know, for me what would be useful would be for, and again, this piggybacks onto some of Julian's work, but to have, for all medical devices, to have a set amount of information that they, a standard for the types and amounts of information they output from that device. Um, you can keep the black box here doing whatever you want proprietary, but at least let me know that what I can see coming out of that RS-232 or whatever kind of connection I've got it meets and conforms to some sort of standard. And, uh, and these uh, terminologies are not static either. They're not. And they're constantly changing. They're, yeah, and the, they're tens of thousands yeah. of them. And, and so, and, and, and the other part that's frustrating about that is marketing people get involved here as well. And so the name may have changed six times, but the underlying <laughs> data and stuff actually hasn't. And we run into that a whole lot. Um, which, which complicates the situation even farther. Uh, to know, you know, just because it's called a different name, is it actually a different thing? Um, yeah. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. So what we'll do now, we'll take a five-minute stretch break, um, but it will just be five minutes. So I, I ask the panel um, to make their way forward, take a stretch, refresh your coffee, and then we'll pick up with the panel in just a couple of moments.